where we will begin. 13, now 14, I thank you. I was fixing to say, I was fixing to teach it again. Wednesday night, yeah, Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday night, everybody, um, this Wednesday you're starting. Larry's going to start a seven-week Bible study on heaven. So that'll be this Wednesday night if you want to go in and be with him. There's no book. He's just going to go through um, the Bible with scriptures and stuff talking about heaven. So that'll be a seven-week course. He's going to come out of Vernon's class for seven weeks and then you can go back when it's done. So we'll do several of those like we did last year that, you know, give you some options on Wednesday night to kind of pick where you want to be. So if you want to find out about heaven, seven weeks, at least find out where you're going. Don't y'all look at the hotel before y'all go on vacation? Or is that only me? That's only you. Yeah. I stay home. I, stay, I, don't, I don't go on vacation. Melinda told me the day she, the day she goes, Blake, you know you're not been on vacation in five years. I said, I'm okay if you ship me to Alaska and I live by myself. Of course, with my family and my wife and my kids, but I, I'm perfectly fine staying home. Now, Melinda wants to go on vacation and go on trips, and the kids do, but for me personally, I, I don't know how to say this nicely. I don't just love people. You know what I mean? I don't just love a vast amount of crazy people. I like people I know in environments I like, and I like my recliner, and I like sitting in the house. That's just what I like. I'm bored like that. Who would, that's right, who would, you know, everybody says, I wouldn't want to be in Alaska. Man, please, I'd be good. Give me my recliner. I'd find something to do during the day. I have a friend of mine, she lived in Missouri, not lived there her whole life, and she got a job working at a penitentiary. Yeah. Penitentiary in Alaska. She moved her and her three kids. Into Alaska. Oh, yeah. I, I can find something to do. That's like all y'all retired people saying, oh, I don't retire, man, please. I can find something to do. I can fish. I can hunt. I do all kinds of things. Do nothing. Just sit around all day. If I want to cut the grass, which I like cutting the grass, which is weird. I like riding the lawnmower. Yeah, I can't. If I can find time, I can't only find time to cut mine. Jimmy has to cut mine sometimes. I have to call Jimmy and tell him sometimes, Jimmy, can you sweep mine and cut my grasses up to my kneecaps? But tonight we're going to talk about the lamb and the hundred forty-four thousand. On Mount Zion. This is continuing that, that little break in the judgments. The judgments are going to start again in 16 um, with the bowl of judgments, which is the final judgments. You know, every other judgment up to this point has been what they call partial judgments, which means a specific judgment poured out on a specific place. Um, the last seven bowl judgments are going to be judgments that affect universally. Okay, so it won't be regionally. Does that make sense? Like, you know, before it said that um, hell struck and a third of the earth died. These next judgments are not going to affect partially. They're going to affect totality leading up into the last, to the end, the final judgment in Armageddon. Everybody knows what Armageddon is, right? Everybody's heard of Armageddon, the final battle between God and Satan. going to happen. So we'll be working towards that. And then after we talk about that, we're going to talk about some really confusing stuff. So that's coming um, about the thousand years after the judgment. How Satan is going to be re-released after a thousand years back on earth. He'll get another army. He said, I've already lost Christy. You didn't even know that was in the Bible, did you? Yeah, you didn't know that was even in the Bible. They're going, and there's, there's like, there's premillennialisms, post, anti. There's like 5,000 millennialisms in that whole situation and I'm going to make y'all all really confused when we get to that part. It's going to be fun. Um, but, you know, that's when they talk about Satan is re-released. Satan gets an army, attacks Christ, because Christ will now be on earth with his church. And Christ will defeat the armies again. And then Satan will be thrown into the pits of hell with the false prophet and the Antichrist. Because remember, we talked about the abyss being separate from the pits of hell. Look at y'all's face. I wish y'all could look at, come up here and look at y'all. We're just like, what? It's in there, trust me. If you move forward, it's in there. It's toward the end. It's like 8, 16, 17, 18. And then 21 when the renewal of the earth and all that good stuff. So we're headed to the mind-blowing stuff. And I want y'all to just remember what I told you from the start. The three important things about Revelation. One, it supplies hope. 
Two, Jesus died and went to heaven. Three, what? He's coming back to ransom the church. If you know Christ, you're going to be where? In heaven. If you know, don't know Christ, you're going to be where? In hell. That's all you really need to know. This other stuff is just formality. Everybody wants to say they know what this all equals out to interpret to be. They might be close, but they don't know exactly unless they are who? God himself and those that are sitting in the throne room of glory right now, I believe they know the plan. But in verse 14, we see in verse 1, it says, Then I look, and behold, the Lamb, capital L, who's the Lamb? Jesus said, was standing on Mount Zion. Now, anytime you see Mount Zion in the, in the Word of God, it is referring to Jerusalem or Israel, right? So Mount Zion is talking about the holy place. Now, here we're not talking about specifically I think you are talking about specifically Mount Zion because Jesus is returning. So when Jesus returns, many believe that's going to be where? In Israel or Jerusalem because of the attack that's going to happen. So this they don't know if this is literal or if this is saying that he is in the throne room of glory, which they are equating to what? The holy city now because the holy city will be where Jesus is. So that's one of those dualities of the scripture. And it says, in with him... 144,000 having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. So the 144,000, once again, we see represented here are what? The remnant, right? The chosen written on his forehead in the heart. We're going to belong to that. It says, And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters and the sound of loud thunder, and the sound which I heard was like the sound of a harpist playing on their harps. Isn't that some contrast in the sounds there? Got a raging water. Thunder and a harp. Does that even seem like it would go together? Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I don't even know what that sounds like. But what it is projecting is the power that is held within the voice of God. And it says, and they sang a new song before the throne. Now, who sang the song? 144,000. It says, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living beasts. Because up to this point, Remember, they were singing a song in the throne room, right? We read it before. I don't know the song, but it's in the scripture. I'd have to go back and read it. But now they are singing a whole other song representing what? A change. Now we are changing from what was to the fruition of what? The final judgment of what God is coming back. So this is the preparation, the transition that is happening in heaven for the returning of Jesus Christ for the final judgment so that we can begin to do what? Usher in the end. It says, And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures. Remember, these are the four living creatures with the eyes all over them that we've heard reference throughout the whole entirety. And the elders. Remember, we had the elders sitting on the throne room of God. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. That's who? The remnant, right? To so the remnant of Israel is singing this song. And they were purchased from the earth. How? Because they didn't, you know, we don't, these people are going to believe in Christ, I believe. And that's why they're in heaven. But they're the remnant that God is going to place in heaven as of Israeli born Jewish people. And these people will be singing a song of their own. He says, these are the ones who have been not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. Is that an indicator? What does the word say? Many believe what that means is not defile themselves with other gods. Okay? Yeah, and, and that what anytime in scripture, scripture compares adultery, adultery spiritually with adultery physically. Does that make sense? Whenever you see in scripture, sometimes they say that spiritual adultery is cheating on God. You know what I mean? So they don't know here. It says these are the ones who have not been defiled with women for they have been kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as the first fruits of God into the lamb. And no lies was found in their mouth. They are blameless. They are blameless. Why? Because they belong to Christ. But many believe this is not an indicator of, okay, they're, they've never been with male or female that way. They're believing this is Spiritual chasteness. You know what it means to be spiritually chaste? Yes, as you are faithful to your husband or wife, it also means to be faithful to who? God and God alone. So, does that mean that these could not mean that these are sexually pure people that are virgins? 
It could very well mean that. I, I don't know. But the, the indication to many is that it's not talking about spiritual purity, which spiritual purity only comes by what? Christ, Jesus. Because technically in the Word of God, if you've ever even thought a lustful thought, you have committed what? Adultery in your heart. Okay? That's kind of what they're implying here, that even if it hadn't been a sexual relationship that way, you can't control your mind. Does that make sense? Can you all control your mind? If that thoughts pop in your mind, now you kill that, you put enough good in, hopefully it overweighs the bad. But that does not mean that it does not come in your mind. And so at the end of the day, spiritual or adultery is just a conception of you can look at somebody and be attracted to that person and according to the word of God, you've what? Already committed adultery in your heart, right? So the, here it could be virgins, literally virgins, or it could be, this. I believe it's going to be the spiritually chaste, meaning they have been faithful to who? Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And then it says, Then I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eter eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. So this angel is going to be talking to who? The earth. And he said with a loud voice, listen to his message, Fear God, give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the waters. And another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great. She who has made all the nations drink of her wine of passion, of her immorality. Now when you take this and then match that to what we talked about, about spiritual purity, do you see the, the relationship here? They mention spiritual purity by John, that these people that are in heaven in the 144,000 are spiritually pure, meaning they've not been defiled. And then we see here the mention of Babylon, and Babylon is always compared to being that of a harlot. Okay? What is a harlot? Everybody knows what a harlot is. We're all grown. Right, a prostitute. So together, when you pair them together, that gives that meaning in verse 4 of it being a spiritually chaste nation, meaning a nation that has not turned their back on God. Which is hard to believe when Israel continually did what? Turn their back on God. So the only way they didn't turn their back on God is through who? Jesus Christ, right? So we see here it says that the first angel flew over and said, Fear God, give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. So this angel is proclaiming to earth, who is still on earth at this time? Who's left on earth at this time, should I say? Remember, the mark of the beast has been distributed. These are the lost, right? These are the ones, and remember, the lost had no indication that they wanted Christ. It got to a point where they were even still mad because Christ was punishing them. And it says that they liked what they were doing, so they were not going to change. So this is the angel proclaiming to those on earth that what was coming. The end. He even gives them one more chance. He says, worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs and the waters. What was the angel saying? It's coming. We're to the end. If you're going to make a decision for Christ, what? Now. You have one last chance. It says that another angel, the second, says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. In the Bible, anytime you see the word Babylon, it equates to an unthinkable evil. Okay? It, it, it basically equates to depravity. Rome in the Bible is always pictured whenever you see Daniel, Daniel of Rome and all this, the interlocking play of that. They always portray Babylon as being a harlot, but they also, Babylon is considered to be unspeakable evil. Roman Empire was, complained, it was compared to being Babylon, not because it was Babylon, but because it had what? The persona of Babylon. Does that make sense? It's that mindset of we're going to do what we're going to do because it's for pure pleasure. Right? We talked about, remember when we talked about um, the spirit of Jezebel, how it's not Jezebel, but it's that, that mindset that I'm going to have it my way. That Babylonian spirit here is that same idea that it's going to be my way regardless of what God wants. And what he is saying here is Babylon's fallen, people. What he's saying is that which you have been putting your faith in, this world system that you have been following and chasing, the reason that you have not committed to Christ is because you have been unfaithful to who? Christ with Babylon. But now that which you have been cheating on and that which you have been falling in love with is now going to be what? Destroyed. You have another chance to do what? Commit to Christ. But this is it because the final judgment is going to happen. He says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great she, had, she who has made all nations drink of wine of passion of her immorality. 
The passion of immorality. Is there passion in immorality? Well, yeah. What verse? <laughs> what verse? We're in verse 8. Same thing. Wrath of fornication, passion of... What the picture here is that the world lusts after immorality. True or false? Have y'all watched TV lately? It is to the point that I can't watch TV with my children because the commercials are so bad that they spark questions that I don't want to answer for a 10-year-old. Y'all ever notice that? It is so bad that my kid can't play games because of the advertisements that they put in the games are so bad that it's worse than the games. You know, they interject advertisements in here. Cole was playing a video game on his phone one time, and next thing we know, there's a lady in a bikini. Now, what that has to do with the game he was playing is they're trying to addict our children to immorality at a young age because then you begin to get a passion for immorality. When y'all were in the world, did y'all have a passion for immorality? Sure. Can't wait till Friday night. Right? Working for the weekend. Wasn't that a song? <laughs> Who's ever been there? Who's ever worked for the weekend, right? Go ahead, raise your hand, Christian. You know you work for the weekend. Don't be patting your head. That's that fake Christian hand, hand raising over here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Can't wait till Friday night. We're going to go out and party and get drunk and have a wild time. And Saturday we'll be sick all day. And then we'll go to church Sunday and ask for forgiveness. You started all week long, eh? <laughs> That's when the, thir the Thursday night happy hour started so you can get a head start on Friday. That's right. Ladies night on Wednesday night so you didn't go to church. Tuesday night, ladies night. Oh, man, we get deep tonight. The, 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 the passion of immorality. But you get to a point in life where you seek the world's passion. And that's what he's telling. The angels are telling the earth that what? Man, all this time you guys have been having passion for the world. And that world that you thought would always stand. And those things that you thought were always going to be there. And that desire you have had for that is passing because guess what? God, the one you should be seeking, is now fixing to level the playing field. He's about to destroy the earth, right? Things are fixing to happen. You need to quit cheating on God is what, what he's saying. And you need to instead turn back to who? God. Because we're only pure through Jesus Christ. That's what it was talking about in those verses above. That the Lamb, He's the reason He has purchased us as first fruits, so that now we can belong to Christ. Now the 144, what are they? The Jewish remnant, which means they inherit the promised land. Why? Because they're promised. Because they're promised. They have a double blessing, don't they? They have Jesus Christ if they ask to be saved. Jesus Christ lives within their heart and soul. One, but two, they have what? A covenant. So they're almost doubly blessed. You reckon that's why they sing in a different song than everybody else? I don't know. They're thinking, thank God we hear them because the rest of our brothers and sisters ain't. Because a lot of them think that Jesus was not the Messiah. They're still looking for the Messiah. So how many of them are going to be fooled when the Antichrist comes on the scene? They try, that's where they tried to. But they don't read any of the scripture. They just picked the number out because it looks biblical. They could have picked out the 666 because that's the number in the Bible too. They're talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have zeal, great people. But you know, they started with 144,000 was going to be just the Jehovah's. And that was there. But they changed that number now. They've increased it. Oh, yeah. If we could convert Jehovah Witnesses to Baptists, oh, that'd be awesome. Because them sap suckers will go to the door. I got something to come to me about every month. So they swing by the house and talk to me. You know, they call me Reverend Blake, knock on the door. We talk about five or ten minutes. And then they get back in the car and they leave and go on the way. They have a zeal for what they believe, but that 144 is not there. there. They had to bump that up because what do you do when you hit 144,500? <laughs> We're full. The way I understand it, I was told, and I don't know if it's true or not, that a lot of world witnesses, they don't believe that they are a part of 144 as reserved for the Jews. 
Right. So these are like second class citizens. Right. Uh, but, and then I've had, I had a friend one time trying to explain it because they were Jehovah that they have to work harder so they can bump somebody out of that spot. So if you in the 144,000, if you're the last one in, you work harder to bump somebody out so you can get in. So it's a work-based religion. Right, to get a little higher. Right. And that would continue until she reached that hundred and forty. Right, until she got into and it's a work based religion. You don't get salvation by grace, you get salvation by works. Who wants to be a part of that? Because what happens when you get to a point where you can't work anymore? What happens if you get old? What if I worked at hundred what if I worked at number five on the list? I get in a wreck, I can't do anything. I'm laid up in the bed all the time. I'm at home thinking, my Lord, I'm falling. To get demoted, I'm out, of the, I'm out of the click because of the... I mean, there's problems with that. But then it says, in verse 9, he says, that this in my Bible, it's tomb, doomed for worshipers of the beast. So now we're going to see the worshipers of heaven. We've seen the guy we're singing a new song. Now we're going to see the transpose of that as being who? Satan's followers here on earth. Because we remember we talked that the Antichrist is going to build a statue... And then the false prophet's going to anoint the statue and it's going to do what? Talk, remember? And many are going to fall down at the feet of this statue and begin to worship the Antichrist. So this is now the angels are going to speak to the Antichrist worshipers on earth. Who will be who? Will that be the rest of the earth? Because if they did not fall down at the feet of the Antichrist, they were going to get what? Killed. They did not worship him. Or if they did not accept what? The mark of the beast, which is a sign of the worship to him, they were going to be killed. So this is the people left. And it says, then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying, so we see the first two fly by. Now we see the third one come along. And it says, if anyone worships the beast, who is who? Satan, or, or Antichrist here. And his image, which is what? The statue that he gave life. Remember, it's going to be a statue that's going to walk and talk like animatronics at Disney World. It says it receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand. So that applies to who? Everybody left on earth, right? Because if you that received the mark, or if you're not worshiping the beast, you have been what? Killed, Killed or disposed of by this point. He says he will also he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Anytime in the Bible, the wrath of God is always explained by wine. I don't know why. Don't ask me. I can, I don't know, every time you get wine, bad things happen. Uh, anytime you see wine in the Word of God, it is always equated to wrath. Except for the new wine, which is always equated to Christ. But see, new wine in the Bible, I'm going to give you a side lesson. New wine in the Bible means pre freshly squeezed wine. Okay? There's a difference between wine in the Bible and new wine. Wine in the Bible is fermented wine that has been put into skins and has been sat up so that the fermentation process can happen so that you can get alcohol. New wine is, in the Bible is freshly pressed grapes that make what? Grape juice. Okay? So the fermentation process has not began on new wine. Okay? Now, new wine is only new wine for a short amount of time. So it's more precious. Because now we have a refrigeration system so you can buy Welch's grape juice off the shelf, keep that in your refrigerator, and you can have Welch's grape juice without it being fermented and getting you drunk. Correct? But in biblical times, they only had the new wine for what? Short amount of time. I don't even know how long it would last unrefrigerated before the fermentation process. So the purity of the new wine was the fact that it was not tainted yet. By fermentation. Make sense? So when Jesus Christ changed the water into wine, they said this is the best wine, which meant what? This is the wine that has not fermented, meaning it is the fresh wine. It's something we don't get often. That's that. That's why Miranda Lambert can't sing the song, Jesus Christ made wine, we'd be a friend, and he'd be a friend of mine, or whatever that song is. Not unless Miranda Lambert likes to drink grape juice. All right, back to this topic. He also drank. 
I, I've heard it a time or two. He also, when I used to go to the bar, he, he also would drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. Anybody want to drink of that? No. The wrath of God put in what? The cup of his anger. This is an indication that when this judgment comes, it's going to be like this. What do you get when you pour something out? You ever poured something out on linoleum? A little bit of fluid on linoleum will go what? Everywhere. So the wrath of God will be poured out and it will what? Encompass everything. Cover everything. He says, and he will be tormented with fire. Who is that? Who's going to be tormented with fire? Satan, right? A little heat. He will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is the indication that at the end, we're going to see the false prophet and we are going to see the Antichrist chained and threw into the pit of hell before the throne judgment seat of Christ in front of the angels and the saints. So this is just declaring what is going to happen. So essentially God is telling through the angels, the people on earth, one, you've been searching and you've been lusting for immorality. Well, now that's all coming to an end because the man you're serving, we're going to what? Chain him up, throw him in a fire. We're fixing to destroy your God. And then we're going to destroy what? You. Your, your time is over. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Is hell short? You get in it for a little while and then you get out. What does forever and ever mean? What is, we can't even fathom that. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever sat and thought, what is eternity? Can't, I, I don't even know if we can. our brains are sophisticated enough to know eternity. Just think of it this way. From God saying, let there be light, to now. And that's still not forever and ever. Right? That's only part. I don't even know what part in the chain of forever and ever that is. That means what? Never ending forever and ever. That means there's no, it's not like, okay, I can say forever and ever and then I die. No, that means you're not going to die. It's going to be what? An eternal fire. Can you imagine? This is why we should try to win our loved ones. Can you imagine your loved one burning in the pits of hell forever and ever because we're not willing to share the gospel? I think sometimes we miss the seriousness. And it still won't make, and, and, that's, and that's bad. And you have to just pray and live it, and, that, and you have to live with the, the regret of that. It, it's horrible to think of, of this for eternity. And it should give us that, I think that desire to, to win them would come by us realizing that this is all real. I think sometimes as Christians, we we believe in God, we believe in heaven, but we just don't think about hell. Because we've already, what, kind of got our ticket punched, and we're already in heaven. But our focus should not be in heaven. Our focus should be, what, on those that have the potential to be in hell. Because that will make us really go after these people. I mean, our churches have failed. The reason we're in the situation that we are in now in our country is we have become complacent. And we've become satisfied with our ticket being punched. I've got my way into heaven. And since I'm going to heaven, what does it really matter about anybody else? And we've taken that mentality and we've allowed the world to then tell us that as Christians, we're fanatical. So then we curb our fanaticism, which in turn leads more to hell. And we have got to a point where we no longer consider the ramifications of forever and ever.
Well, there's no, and the, and, the, and the important thing is, there's going to be people that do not accept Christ that are close to us because we can't change the hearts of people. You know, we might want to so bad, but we can't change those their hearts. God can if they allow it, but God still allows free will. And what we have to do is just make sure that we are being diligent to live it in front of them and being diligent to, to being the best person and Christian we can be, and we can't give up. We just have to keep every time, like you said, just making it a continual, do you know you're going to go to heaven when you die? You know, just kind of just take that pattern, that, and it's that, that weight that you have to carry. But you can't beat yourself up. No, you can't control it. I mean, at the end of the day, there's no way you can control the outcome, but you just have to do everything that you can. And the problem is, we, as Christians, where we have people that are, are seeking to do that with everything they got, We've got some Christians that are doing what? Not a thing. And the effort has to be there. I think that's the important thing. God, God understands the effort. And I think He rewards the effort. But we can't make people. If we could make people, nobody would be lost. You know, we just pencil in. And the, and the tragedy is that not everybody we know is going to come to know Christ. And, I, and we can't control that. But we have to just make sure that we understand the importance of still sharing even when they're angry and even when they're turned off. And even if it means me hurting your feelings to save your life, then I've got to hurt your feelings. And i got to love you enough to look at you and say, this is what I believe and I'm going to hurt your feelings every time I get around you. And that's just going to be how it is. And because I love you that much. And just praying and hoping that at some point something happens. And then it says, they have no rest day and night. Can you imagine that? Forever and ever, you have no rest. You ever been tired? Like on Fridays, I work all night Fridays, and a lot of times I'll come home and I try to stay up so I can actually spend some time with my family who I haven't seen. When I start on Wednesday, I don't see Mom, my Melinda, or the boys for two or three days because of the way my schedule falls. So on Saturday, I stay up. And by about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I haven't had rest, and I've worked like 30, been up like 36 hours, you just get to feel it crummy. So your heart beat gets erratic. You feel nauseated. You ever been there? You just irritable. irritable. You just don't feel well. And I could not believe a time when you got no rest, day or night. And it says, and those who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. His here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord for now, from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds will follow them. So we see that before, the ones that follow the devil, when they die, they are forever without what? Rest. But when we see Jesus, and when we follow Christ and we die, Christians will, etern will receive what? Eternal rest. Y'all see the paradox of that? You've got one group that's going to be, what, torture, no rest, no peace. And then you see heaven as what? Eternal rest. Have you ever heard that before? You're going into your eternal rest. A place of rest and a place of refuge and a place of relaxation. Doesn't heaven sound good already? You want to have a full class, Larry? Well, what it, at, at the point from now on is what he's talking about is even the ones that have happened in the past. But even now, if somebody committed to Christ, they would still determine to hear you from now on. I mean, it still does not change the fact that God's salvation is still present here. You know, the God's salvation will not stop, stop until when? Until it's over. Right? So I still believe that God is still giving people the chance in this time. And here we got to remember too, Martha, that those who refuse to accept the mark of the beast might still be alive and not been killed yet and not been found out. And because they have not accepted the mark of the beast, they have denied that. They're, in sin, they're basically doing what? Accepting Christ. So they, those would still what? Go to heaven when the judgment fell. Because they are essentially by denouncing the beast, you're accepting who? Christ. See, there's so much involved in this that it's hard to point out exactly what it is, you know? But the number that will get to heaven 
at this point, it's going to be limited. It's not like it's going to be a vast, a mass exodus. Yeah, and that's what it's saying. He's saying, you know, at this point, it's going to be rubber meets the road. That, you know, you might have a few left that hadn't been found out yet. Some of these preppers living in a container in the middle of the woods somewhere. Right, but when the judgment falls, they're still going to die in order to get that final salvation. Who wants to take that chance? You know, there's some people who roll that dice. I'll just wait. I'll wait it out. Maybe I can get saved. I'll live like I want to live now. Maybe I can get saved before that last push. Then we see in verse 14, he says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man. Anytime you see that, that's referring to who? Jesus normally. And it says, Having a crown of gold, which further indicates lineage of royalty, which is God, which is saying that he has the ability to do the, whatever he wants to do next because he is what? God, because he has that crown of what? Life on his head. He says, he had on his head and he, a sharp sickle in his hand. Now what a sickle is, have you ever seen a sickle? We're not talking about a pop sickle. Why do they call that a pop sickle? Because it ain't shaped like a sickle. The ice sickle. Why well, it is not a shaped like one, but a sickle is one of these curved blades. You ever been to... Pennsylvania, the Amish people mow their grass with it. It's the Amish lawnmower. That sickle with two hands and you do like this. And what it does is a blade that's curved and when you swing it, it cuts everything. Now what they used to do in biblical times is they would cut wheat like that. Then they would gather the wheat and then they would take the wheat on the threshing floor and then they would take a fork and they would grab that wheat and throw it up in the, in the air. The wheat would fall to the ground and the chaff, which is fake wheat, would blow away. So that's how they would separate the wheat from the chaff. Now that's what they say in the end time. You remember, Jesus made that reference that God will separate. Well, the separation at this point is what? Over. So he's not harvesting here. He is what? Destroying here. See the difference? Before is going to be a harvest. A harvest is a time of peace and a time of happiness. Especially in biblical days, whenever the harvest came in, that's how you live. So when you had the harvest, what did you have? Why do y'all think y'all have fall festivals? Why do we have those things in the fall? Because that's an indication that the harvest is over. We've been blessed and we've had bounty. So that's why we have Thanksgiving and that's why we do those things. It's because that's supposed to be a happy time. But here, the beginning of this harvest is not going to be to harvest, but it is going to be to what? Destroy Instead of harvesting, it's going to be to mow down. We see that it says, And another angel came out of the temple, crying out loud with a voice to him, him being God, being Jesus, who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap. For the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, ripe here is not right with love. You know what Jesus, oh, remember Jesus said, the fields are white with harvest, but the laborers are few. You've all heard that, that statement. That is referring to those that are lost that can still attain heaven. Here what he is saying is these are going to be right for what? Wrath and destruction. And that time is what? Past. So when he reaps here, it's not a reap to lift up, but a reap to what? Destroy. destroy. Right? This is Jesus reaping the harvest. And he says... Then he who sat on the cloud is a sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. So Jesus, what? Reaps the earth. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. So we see that this angel comes out as well with a mission from the throne room of heaven to do what? Reap. And it says, then it, it, putting it, saying, then the angel said to him, Another angel, the one who has the power over fire, came out of the altar and he called to the loud voice to him who had a sharp sickle saying, put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth because her grapes are ripe. Once again, not ripe with heavenly goodness, but ripe with what? Evil and destruction. It says, so the angel swung his sickle up to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into a great wine press of the wrath of God. Grandpa, he had a sickle. Mm -hmm. And that sucker was about that long. 
and it had two handles on a, a long pole with two handles. Right. And he would swing that thing, and it was a much bigger swamp than 18 inches. Oh, yeah. It was like a weed eater. Well, a weed eater on steroids will never do like a sickle. <laughs> right. But you've got to swing the sickle. Right. You've got to swing it. It don't swing itself. But then the indication is here at the end that these grapes are sickled, and then they're what? Pressed. Okay? Now, does this mean that the angel is going to come out with a huge sickle and chop the earth? Could be. But we don't know. Many believe that this is an indication that in one fell swoop, God will destroy the earth. All the men on the earth. And it will press them in a wine press of God's wrath. So it's an indication of the falling of what? God's wrath on man. Right? The wiping out of, of man. And the wine press was trodden outside the city. And the city and the blood came out from the wine press up to the bridles of a horse. For a distance of 200 miles. In verse 20. Did y'all hear what I said? That's the people on earth. That he will kill the people on earth. And the blood will be up to the bridles on a horse. How high is a horse normal, James? The bridles of a horse. Probably my chest. Imagine four foot, four and a half foot for 200 miles. Are there any lakes around here that's 200 miles long? Great lakes, maybe some. So picture one of the great lakes, nothing but blood. How much blood would that take? You know what 200 miles equates to? The parameters of Israel. So it's almost, many believe that this will be that great war at the end. God will come and destroy the armies that are fighting against Israel and those that are left on earth that have not ascended into heaven to the point that it does what? Destroys everybody and the blood will run to the bridles on horses. Fun times. Who wants to be there? We can all swim in the vat of blood. Can you imagine? Even the Civil War. How many people lost... Anybody Civil War buffs in here? The, the greatest battle in the Civil War was what? How many people died? Hundred and some thousand? Huh? Two hundred and forty thousand. Did the blood run up to the horses' bridles? Probably nowhere near that, did they? Because you'd think the ground would soak up some of it. So how much blood would it take? And how much death would it take? It was a big battle, man. That's scary, isn't it? I'm glad I ain't going to be here. I'm glad I'll be looking in heaven. Maybe I'll get a recliner up there. Oh, yeah. I think at this point, if you're not aware of who God is, you're in trouble. Because God's done killed a third of the earth with this calamity and a third of the earth with this calamity and a third of the earth with this calamity. And, and all these things have already started happening. And, and this interlude kind of ends here because now we're going to play back to the plagues. So the plagues are going to be happening at this point. So, Because remember we talked about this not being in a, in a chronological order. Yeah, Earl. 620,000. Right. So in, in the Civil War, that, that's how many died. And you had nowhere near that vast amount of collection of blood up to the horse's bridle. You know, don't you think them angels are going to be saying, boy, we've been waiting on this. <laughs> Could be. Some of them angels has probably been sitting over there thinking, man, we get ready to get all these people because they killed Christ. I mean, even it says the martyrs before the throne room of God. Remember, we read that several chapters back. They're begging Christ for what? Kill that bunch. Go ahead and kill them. Destroy them. They're begging for it. But God in His mercy says what? Not yet. There's one I'm waiting for. There's, there's a deadline and a time. I'm still working on a time frame. And in 15, which will be the one that we see next, and we'll talk about next week, we'll see the seven plagues. So remember how I told you we kind of had an interlude? Remember when we had the, the judgments that were passed, and then you kind of had that break where we've kind of laid out who the Antichrist is, and we kind of told who the characters of all this is? This chapter ends that little soliloquy. Y'all didn't know I knew that kind of word, did you? 
soliloquy, like a break in the action so we can explain where everybody is coming from. So the next thing is that pouring out of the plates is a scene of heaven. So we're going to see that now the, the vision is going to change from an interlude back into what? Judgment. As we begin to wear out the final end. That's what makes Revelation so hard is that it's not chronological. Yeah, it's almost like a prequel to the end. So you know the end's going to happen and God's going to reap. But you want to see the, how that reaping happens now. Does that make sense? Because the bowl judgments is what's the next judgment. They call it the bowl judgments because it's kind of indicative of wine being poured out. Remember it says here that we talked about the wrath of God being poured out on the earth. The bowl judgments is almost the indication of a bowl being poured upon the earth. And we're going to see that some is going to be poured on the land. Some is going to be poured into the ocean and it's going to turn to blood. Some is going to be poured into the rivers and the springs and they're going to be turned to blood. We're going to see that a great earthquake happens. So we're going to see six bold judgments followed by the final seventh bold judgment which equates to a great earthquake which means it's done. Finished. So we're getting there but God had to kind of give you. God's kind of like a good play writer. He gives you a little bit, then he has to go back. Y'all ever seen the movies that you see a little bit, then you have to go back and get the background so that you can see a little more? And then you start to end and play, play forward. So that's kind of where we're at. And that's what loses people. Because you get caught up in the chronological. Because even the Bible, chronologically, is not always what we think it is chronologically. If you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have some of the same stories, but how are they in order? They're transposed. Does that change the events? No, it just means that what? That author put it in a different spot because that's how God wanted it. So God wanted it this way for a reason. God revealed it to John this reason. Do you think John just put it in this order? John's seen it in this order. So can you imagine what John's thinking? Because John's looking at a world that he ain't seen yet. They didn't have cars and planes and automobiles when John walked the earth. Can you imagine the visions that he saw was of present day skyscrapers and airplanes and tanks and missiles. Can you imagine what John's brain was thinking? Monsters and fire-breathing dragons and missiles and rocks out of the sky called wormwood. That could be what? A nuclear bomb. There's just all kinds of stuff that we can't imagine what John would. It would be like us looking 50 years in the future. Will we recognize anything? We were talking about the other day. Have y'all realized how far technology has advanced in the last 10 years? I remember, yeah, what, 10 years ago, but in 96 when I graduated high school, we didn't have cell phones. <clears throat> you thought that was magic. <laughs> well, you know, even me, when I come out of high school, like Christy said, we had a beeper. You had to do that 911 on somebody's phone to get them to call back. Oh, yeah. The, the watches that everybody has. And so it is just like a super, and you had none of that then. And then it's almost like when the cell phone was invented, I think I was 21 when I got my first cell phone. It was a flip phone, and I thought I was doing it. And it was like $25 a month. That's before Verizon got smart and realized we can't live without phones and get you addicted to them. So they, they can charge you vast amounts for the same thing you yeah, y'all do realize long distance calls cost no more than it does to run with regular. I learned that in college. And that ticked me off the end. It costs, right, right, it costs no more money to call a long distance phone call. And they just charge you more. It's just part of the plan. But then when the phones came out, it went from flip phones to smartphones in like four years. And then from smartphones to where we are today, and now we have smart watches. And now we have what? Face recognition software. You know, there's phone, Melinda's phone, she just looks at it and it comes on. She has to be fancy. Fingerprint recognition on your phone, right? You just touch the back of your phone and it knows it's me and it pops up. That's how I log in. And we are to that point. So technology is very, is where it needs to be for the end of times to begin. And the stage is already being set in our own political arena to advance that. It's also being set in the political arenas of the world to advance that. We are headed there. I do not believe we got 20 more years. My children will see the end times. 
even if I don't. They will see the end times. I honestly believe that. And I honestly believe the Antichrist is in the world. Now, he might be three, or he might be one. I would hope that ain't my baby. Can't be, because he ain't come down to America. But you know what I mean. Whoever's in Greece and Europe that's got the baby, I feel sorry for you. That you could. Oh yeah, it's not. But I, I honestly believe that I'll be here, but I I, I can't say with certainty that no, I will. I, but I can say with pretty much certainty I do believe our children will be there. Because look at the degradation of the United States of America right now. If God allows America to continue down the path that they're coming down, He'll have to write a handwritten apology to Sodom and Gomorrah because He destroyed them for what we're doing today. And it ain't gonna get there. I'm telling you, it's just. We are headed down the path to the end. And that's why we have to be so urgent and so deliberate in our ministries to win people to Christ. Stand with me, too. We'll start 16. I thought we'd get through two, but I talked too much. 15, whichever one it is. I don't know. 21. Next week, we're going to do prayer. We ain't doing it next week. My brain needs a break. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for another day. I love you. Thank you for your word. Pray that you'll continue to help our church grow. Help us to grow in you. I pray that you'll keep everyone safe, Lord. I pray for the storm, God. It's your will. If it's your will for it to hit, it'll hit, Lord. And, and we know that you trust that you're going to take care of us. Pray, Lord, that you'll ease our fears and worries and understand that you've got it all under control. In your precious name, I pray, God.